Okay, uh, quick review. The, the kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven that Jesus inaugurated at his first coming will be consummated or finalized at his return, at his second coming. And as I said last week, Christ's return will be personal. It will be Jesus himself who is returning, and it will be visible and glorious. There's going to be no mistaking the second coming. There's not going to be an argument about it. Did the second coming occur? It's going to be known. It will be something that's clear and obvious. Now, when the Lord returns, the resurrection of the dead and the transformation of the living will occur. Those who are alive when he comes will be transformed. Those who have already died will be resurrected. So that's going to occur when Christ returns. And as I talked about last week, the body will be restored to life. And that body will also be transformed. Okay, and I spent quite a bit of time on that. The body will be restored to life, but the body will be transformed as with Christ's resurrection, who's the first fruits of the resurrection, the model or prototype of the resurrection. We will be raised with supernatural bodies, bodies that are no longer subject to death, as Christ was no longer subject to death after his resurrection, as Paul says in Romans 6, 9. So that's how we're going to be raised. We'll be raised with bodies that are imperishable, glorious, powerful, and immortal, as Paul explains and spells out in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So with Christ coming, there'll be the resurrection, there'll be this transformation, and not only will our bodies be transformed so as to be suitable for eternity with God, but all of creation will be transformed, as Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 23, as we talked about last week, heaven and earth will be unified in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10, where he says that his will for the outworking, the end game, for the administration of the end is to unify heaven and earth in Christ. This idea of heavenization will occur. The eternal state, which will come about in conjunction with Christ's return, it's going to be a redeemed and transformed creation. A heavenized creation, a reality in which or from which sin and all of its consequences have been expunged. It will be a redeemed creation. The curse will have been lifted, as it says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 3. And creation itself will have been freed from its slavery or bondage to decay, as Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 20 and 21. That state is what the Bible in several places calls the new heavens and new earth. It's the divine utopia in which Christians will dwell forever in resurrection bodies and in which there will be no evil. There will be no suffering, no mourning, no crying, and no pain. It will be a perfect existence. You see, and this is a, this is a glorious vision. Now, I have just a bit, to, a bit more to say about aspects of Christ's return, and then I want to cover the intermediate state of the dead in whatever time we have left. I'm not going to carry over. So next week, Lord willing, we're going to begin our study of the book of Lamentations. So I just want to uh, go through a little bit here. A couple more things about aspects of Christ's return, just briefly, then we'll turn our attention to the intermediate state of the dead. Now, when I talk about new heavens and new earth, I want to alert you to the fact that in the Protestant world, There is some debate about, particularly Lutherans take the view, that, well, is is the new heavens and new earth, is it going to be that the old creation is going to be completely scrapped and something entirely new is going to be created? Or is it going to be, this old thing is going to be radically transformed? Okay, Lutherans tend to favor this annihilation and replacement idea. I'm with people like Wayne Grudem and many others I I think he expresses this well here. He says the radical transformation position. In other words, it's not going to all be scrapped and start replaced. It's going to be redeemed or transformed. The radical transformation position seems preferable here, for it's difficult to think that God would entirely annihilate his original creation, thereby seeming to give the devil the last word and scrapping the creation that was originally very good, Genesis 131. The passages above that speak of shaking and removing the earth and of the first earth passing away may simply refer to its existence in its present form, not its very existence itself, 
And even 2 Peter 3.10, which speaks of the elements dissolving and the earth and the work on it being burned up, may not be speaking of the earth as a planet, but rather the surface things on the earth, that is, much of the ground and the things on the ground. In other words, I look at this burning as a, you know, this is a picture of the purification. So that we, when we have here, it's going to, there's going to be a transforming event, and what comes through that event is purified in a sense that it is redeemed, all of the consequences of sin have been taken out. So I'm with the folks that say, listen, no, it's a, it's a radical transformation rather than a scrapping and a complete starting over. But I just wanted to alert you to that discussion and that debate in the Protestant world. Now, I have another quote here I want to read to you that really doesn't fit in. But sometimes people ask, say, listen, when Christ came, why didn't he do all these things? Why didn't he heal everybody and all that? And this is from a, a sermon by a guy named John Piper. It's from his sermon, Christ and Cancer. And I saw it some years ago, and I liked it, and I wanted to share it with you. He says, the answer to why Jesus did not raise all the dead is that contrary to the Jewish expectation, the first coming of the Messiah was not the consummation and full redemption of this fallen age. The first coming was rather to purchase that consummation, illustrate its character and bring a foretaste of it to his people. Therefore, Jesus raised some of the dead to illustrate that he has the power and one day will come again and exercise it for all his people. And he healed the sick to illustrate that in his final kingdom, this is how it will be. There will be no more crying or pain anymore. So sometimes people wrestle with that, and I just thought that was a good statement of it. So we have the second coming. We have this return of Christ. We have the resurrection. And in conjunction with that, there's going to be a judgment, a great final judgment of all people. You see that in many texts. There will be a final judgment of all people, and the criterion of that final judgment will be one's relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what, the, that's what that judgment is going to be based on, the criterion of that judgment. And those verses that speak of looking to one's works as the basis of judgment, and you do have texts like that, for example, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, Matthew 25, 31 to 46, John 5, 20, 29, Revelation 20, verse 12. You have a number of texts that look to, that talk about looking to works as the basis of the judgment. But those texts, they reflect the fact that biblical faith is accompanied by faithful living. You see, it's not, it's not a great mystery. That biblical faith, a person who has biblical faith, inevitably has fruit of that faith. Inevitably works as a consequence of that faith. Inevitably has signs of that faith. You cannot believe Jesus is Lord and have that have no impact on how you live. Because if that's the case, if your faith produces nothing, well, what does James call it? Well, he calls it a dead faith, you see. In other words, it's not, it's not faith in a biblical sense, saving faith. So that's what's going on here in those things. It's just looking at the other end of the stick is the way I put it. Okay, so the the criterion of judgment is one's relationship with Jesus Christ and the judgment at Christ's return. You see, the judgment here is is going to be permanent and irrevocable. The righteous and the ungodly, they'll be sent to as resurrected or transformed persons. The righteous and the ungodly are going to be sent to their respective places, heaven and hell. Or they will live for eternity. You can see that in Matthew 25 and other places. So you're going to have this assignment, this judgment, this sending. And for the resurrected, those who had died prior to Christ's return, the judgment is going to be in keeping with their initial separation at death. In other words, it will be in keeping with that, this separation by which their spirits were assigned to different locations, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So it will be consistent with that. And the redeemed, as I've said, those who are saved, the redeemed, uh, they're going to spend eternity as resurrected beings in a new heaven, new earth, in a perfect reality. And you and I can't grasp the glory of that. You see, it, it's beyond, you know, and I've said a number of times when people say, well, you know, I'm going to get bored. Uh, you know, and see, it, it, that's no. And I use kind of a perverse analogy where sometimes you have drug people who, whether it's been, you know, when they first did meth or something like that, and they got hooked on it right away, sometimes say, look, I, I, I had an experience. I went to a place I never wanted to leave. Okay, well, just understand that idea. You're never going to want to leave. It's not going to be a place. It's going to be 
thoroughly, completely, absolutely satisfying. You see? And so, but it's hard to talk about those things because uh, it's just that grand. All right, let's talk about the intermediate state of the dead. Okay, the intermediate state of the dead, and what I mean by that is that the, the state of people between death and the resurrection. What's up with that? Okay, where, you know, what's the story there? If resurrection is the final goal, the ultimate outcome, what about the state of people now? People who've died this side of the resurrection. Well, let me say a little bit about the nature of death, first of all. Hey, the nature of death, according to Scripture, physical death is the cessation of life in its familiar bodily state. Okay, it's not the end of existence. In other words, life and death are two different states of existence. Dying is the transition from one state to another. Okay, so, so you have two different states of existence. It is not the end of existence. It is the cessation of life in its familiar bodily state. When you die, that, that is going into a different state of existence. We are composed of two elements. This is how I understand it. I'll say a little bit here in a second about, I understand there's a, some issue about that. But we're composed of two elements. There's a material component, the body. And there is a non-material, an immaterial component, the soul or spirit. Now, there are passages like 1 Thessalonians 5.23 and Hebrews 4.12 that raise the question of whether soul and spirit are separate. Because they refer to body, soul, and spirit. Okay, well, are these three different components, or is it body, soul, slash, spirit? You see, are these two synonyms for the same non-material component? You have body and soul, slash, spirit, or is it three distinct things? Body, soul, and spirit. Well, I'm with those that say, no, I think it's really two. I think it's body and soul. Uh, Jack Cottrell in his book, The Faith Once for All, he says, The Bible sometimes lists synonymous terms together to express completeness without intending to imply that each term refers to a separate, distinct item. And I think you can see that, for example, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. It says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now, most people understand that, that he's piling up roughly synonymous terms for the inner man. These are roughly synonymous ways of emphasizing the inner man to show how how completely we're to love God. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Okay, so I mean, that's how you get an example of it there. Then favoring this two-element view is the fact that Scripture uses soul and spirit interchangeably in a number of places. Let me just give you a few examples. In, in Job chapter 7, verse 11, it says, Therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of So you see Hebrew parallelism here, that spirit and soul are being used uh, in a parallel, synonymous way. So that's one illustration. Isaiah 26, 9 says, My soul yearns for you in the night. My spirit within me earnestly seeks you. Same idea. You can see them being paralleled there. And when Jesus was praying in the garden prior to his arrest and crucifixion, he confessed in John 12, 27, My soul is troubled. And then in John 13, 21, when speaking of the coming betrayal of Judas, John says Jesus was troubled in his spirit. So it seems you have the same idea. My soul is troubled. Jesus was troubled in his spirit. Uh, you don't see a distinction being made. At least I don't see it. It seems that they are uh, synonymous terms. Mary's joyful response to the news of her impending conception it includes this refrain where she says, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And as a uh, Greg Boyd and Paul Eddy, they they write in their book Across the Spectrum, they say, Mary certainly was not referring to different parts of herself. One magnified the Lord and the other rejoiced in her Savior. All exegetes, that may be an overstatement, all exegetes agree that this refrain is an example of Hebraic parallelism, well, they'll agree with that, in which the same thing is said in two different parallel ways. The fact spirit and soul can be paralleled in this way shows that they are synonymous. 
So this is the idea. This is how I understand it. But I'm aware of the contention. You know, it's called whether you're a dichotomist or a trichotomist. Okay? Whether there are two components or three. Okay? I just, but I, I'm of the two school, as uh, Wayne Grudem says. He's a, a theologian. He says, everything that the soul is said to do, the spirit is also said to do. And everything the spirit is said to do, the soul is also said to do. And just lest you think this is somehow an odd view, according to Millard Erickson, he's another theologian, the two-element view, what I'm presenting to you, what I think is, is correct, this is probably, quote, the most widely held view through most of the history of Christian thought. So it's not odd, it's not eccentric, uh, you know, but I say there are people that would go three. All right, so I'm saying to you, look, human beings... We are composed that we have two components. We have this bodily component, this physical component, and we have a a non-material component, which I call soul slash spirit. Now, physical death involves, uh, physical death or the loss of life, it involves the separation of the body from soul slash spirit. That's what death is. It is the separation from the body of the soul slash spirit. You can see that, for example, in James chapter 2, verse 26. It says, for just as the body without the spirit is dead. That says, it's just as the body without the spirit. What's that? That's death. Just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Genesis chapter 35, verse 18 refers to Rachel's soul departing at death. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7 refers to the spirit Returning to God, Matthew 27, 50, Jesus gave up his spirit. Luke chapter 8, verse 55, you see the restoration of Jairus' daughter to life is described as what? As her spirit returning. You see, it's described as her spirit returning. Acts chapter 7, verse 59, Stephen prays for Jesus to receive his spirit. Second Peter 3, Second Peter chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, Peter speaks of dying as putting off his tent. You see this idea of the spirit departing. So this is what death is. It's the separation of body and spirit. Millard Erickson, uh, that theologian I mentioned, he has what I consider to be a very helpful analogy when he speaks of a, a, a chemical compound. See, in a mixture, the atoms of the elements retain their distinctive characteristics because they retain their separate identities. In other words, they change physically but they don't change chemically. They don't combine chemically, okay, as they do in a compound. So in a compound, the the atoms of the elements, they combine to form molecules. They form something different. An example of it is just a simple table salt, which is the compound sodium chloride. You can't detect the, detect the the qualities of either sodium or chlorine. So you have these two... Elements that combine to form something completely different. And I think that's, that's how it is with our being. We are these two components that have been combined to, to create us. We are this unitary compound of a non-material component and a material component, and that compound is dissolved at death. Now, what happens at resurrection? At resurrection, that compound, we have the non-material component, the soul slash spirit, it is then united with a transformed body. You see, so we have, so we have it, this unity is dissolved, and then at the resurrection we have this transformed physical thing that is now immortal, glorious, powerful. We now have this compound created through the union of these. So anyway, that's helpful to me, whether it's helpful to you, uh, I, I share it with you, I like that. So we have, that's, physical death is the separation of body slash soul, of of, of the soul or spirit from the body. Now there's also, of course, other forms of death, that's physical death, that's the separation of soul, spirit from the body, but scripture also speaks, scripture speaks of spiritual death and eternal death. Whether it uses those terms, you see the idea that there is a spiritual death, because it speaks of people alive as being dead. Well, what does that mean? That means that they are dead in the sense they're separated or alienated from God. So that is a sense of a spiritual death there. Then you also have eternal death, which Revelation calls the second death, and that's the finalizing of that state of separation from God. 
So we have physical death, you have spiritual death, you have eternal death. And of course, the redeemed aren't subject to eternal death. We're not separated from God. So that won't, that's not something that's going to be finalized. All right. That's something on the nature of death. Now let's talk about between death and resurrection. You wondered if I'd ever get to it. All right. Uh, what about the state between death and resurrection? All right. It is a first thing I want to point I want to make is that it is a conscious existence. Between death and resurrection, it is a conscious existence. Death is portrayed as a conscious existence. In Isaiah chapter 14, verses 9 and 10, Ezekiel 32, verse 21 and verse 31, Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31, and Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. Now in Isaiah 14, 9 and 10, the inhabitants of Sheol, this is the realm of the dead, in, in Hebrew, the dimension, I don't know what term you like, you know, the realm, the abode, or the place, wherever. The, the realm of the dead, uh, the inhabitants there are described as shades or uh, weak ones. And the reason for that is that they're only a shadow or a reflection of the full persons they are on earth. That's what's behind in, in that, that idea of shades. So you see that in, you have Sheol as the realm of the dead, as it's described there, named in Hebrew. And in Greek, that same place is called Hades. Okay, so that's the realm of the dead. But you see it as a conscious existence in those texts that I mentioned. The parable in Luke 16, 19 to 31, the godless rich man, he knows where he is. He knows where Lazarus is. He knows all those things, and he knows that he has brothers back on earth. And the I is still the I. He was back on earth, and he still has memory. So we see these, these attributes or these qualities being discussed in that, in that parable. Now, now, it's a parable, and some people say, well, since it's a parable, you can't know anything. But even though it's a parable, I think one can draw from it truths about one state after death. And the reason I think that is that the main point of the parable, the main point of, of the teaching of the parable, is to warn people, to, he, he wants to warn them of the danger of rejecting kingdom ethics. That's what Jesus is doing. In particular there, the, the ethic of concern for the needy, because rejecting kingdom ethics is rejecting God. So he's warning them, listen, if you do not live for God so that you walk over this poor suffering, miserable Jewish brother day in and day out. Well, you've rejected God. And the consequence of that is going to be torment in this afterlife, in this intermediate state. So the purpose of it is to warn people about the danger of doing that. And so if people are not conscious after death, then what does that mean? That means that Jesus then is trying to influence them to right living by giving them a false impression of the intermediate state. Now, I just can't see him doing that. That would be duplicitous. Okay, so even though it's a parable, I think I can, in fact, draw information from it about the state, uh, the intermediate state. Now, I suppose somebody could argue that, well, look, the portrayal of conscious torment there, that's hyperbole. It's, a, you know, it's an a exaggeration for a purpose. Okay, that's hyperbole designed to dramatize the horror of unconscious existence. I, I, you know, somebody wants to, to say that, but see, that would require one to demonstrate that a first century Jew would understand it that way. Right? Jesus is telling this parable. Somebody says, no, that's hyperbole. He really, you know, what's really going on is there, he's dramatizing the horror of what it means to be unconscious and that kind of thing. You say, well, is that how a Jew would understand it? And you'd have to demonstrate that before that becomes a plausible understanding of what Jesus is doing. And that seems to be an impossible task because among the beliefs about the afterlife in first century Judaism was the belief that the spirits of the ungodly were tormented and the spirits of the godly were blessed in the period between death and the day of final judgment. You can see that in Second Esdras chapter 7, just as an example. So that was among the ideas in first century Judaism. Now here's Jesus saying, by the way, you need to take seriously the ethics of God. You need to take seriously your commitment to God, because if you reject those things and thereby reject God, this is what the future holds. 
Well, how would he be understood? He would be understood as saying, yeah, there's going to be conscious suffering. Because that was among the ideas of first century Judaism. So I don't see how that argument can work. Okay, I just, I, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not persuaded by that. Now, so, so it's a conscious state. I say it's a conscious state because we have death portrayed as a conscious state in a number of texts, particularly in this parable that I just mentioned. But also, Jesus told the crucified thief, or the, the insurrectionist, the rebel, in Luke 23, verse 43, that he would be with him that day in paradise. Okay, now the notion of paradise, that has connotations of pleasantness, that seem completely at odds with unconsciousness. Right? I mean, tell you, here, here we're going to have, you're going to be, you're going to be today in paradise, but you won't know it. You won't know a thing about it. Be like saying, hey, I'm going to take you to this great restaurant, dear, and knock her in the head. I took you. And she'd be going, thanks. <laughs> that was great. Okay, so I think it, it's implicit. Consciousness is implicit. In that statement about that he's going to take him, that he's going to be with him in paradise. Now, the fact sleep is used for a metaphor for death doesn't mean that the soul slash spirit is unaware of existence. You have people uh, make that argument sometimes. The imagery of sleep it's based on the appearance of the body in death. You see, that's where that, that's where that comes from. A person who's dead resembles a person who's sleeping because their body lies motionless. Right? When you're dead, you're just there. You're just there. You're not moving. And as a sleeping person rises in the morning, so too the dead will rise in the resurrection. That's what's behind the idea, that metaphor of sleeping for being dead. It says nothing about the state of the soul or spirit that has departed the body. It's not focusing on that. It's not talking about that. So I don't think somebody say, well, he says sleep, so you don't really know what's going on. No, it looks pretty clear that there is a conscious existence. See, for information about the state of the spirit that's departed the body, we have to look to other scriptures, and they indicate that there is a consciousness. At least they do to me and to many other people, that there is a consciousness here. Now, second thing, so when we talk about existence in this intermediate state, First thing is that it is a conscious existence, and the second thing is that there is a distinction in the conditions of existence. <clears throat> now that's important. It's conscious, but there there is a distinction in the conditions of existence. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus that I mentioned in Luke chapter 16, it presupposes a distinction between the post-death conditions of the righteous and the wicked. The ungodly rich man, he's in misery. And the godly poor man is in a state of blessing and comfort. And you see that that distinction is clearly fixed. There's, a, there's an impassable chasm that exists between those two, so there are no crossovers. Luke chapter 23, verse 43, Jesus refers to the blessed post-death state of the righteous. He calls that paradise. See, that's how he refers to the blessed post-death state of the righteous he calls it paradise, and he told the thief that the thief would be with him in paradise that day. So to me, the, the key thing, see, the key thing is that death for the Christian is not viewed as an unpleasant prospect. You see, it is not viewed as an unpleasant prospect. Revelation 14.13 says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 to 23, Paul says that to him, that to him, to live is Christ and to die is gain, and that his desire is to depart and be with Christ, for this is far better. You see, now he understands that he has work to do, and God makes it clear to him that he's not going to, and he has other things to do. But you see clearly that idea that, you know, to depart and be with Christ, for this is far better, and you see that same sentiment expressed in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 to 8. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 2.15 that Christ's death was intended to free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. See, so I think it's important for Christians to understand, see, that death is not something unpleasant in the sense of when you die, you go to a blessed existence. You see? You go to a blessed existence. And that's good. <laughs> I like that. 
You see, I keep trying to hang on to John. He's ready to go. He keeps telling me that. I keep telling that boy. So you're not leaving me here, dude. <laughs> but he's ready. So, but you see that, and I think that's important. Now, there's a discussion I've had with people through the years about whether uh, Christians enter heaven at death or do they go into some other blessed realm. You may say, well, who cares? And to some extent, I, I'm with you on that. What's clear is that is that when Christians die, they enter immediately into a blessed realm or a blessed state. Okay? Clear. Now, the question is, is it proper to call that state in which they enter at death heaven? You see? Is that, is that, is that accurate to say that they enter into heaven at the point of death? Or is it simply a pleasant region of Hades? The realm of the dead, the abode of the dead. So here we have this realm of the dead, and we have paradise, and we have this punitive place. Is that where they go? Or is it legitimate, proper, accurate to say, no, when they die, they go to heaven? Okay, and that may seem uh, esoteric, but it, it comes up, and I want to say a little bit about it. Now, it seems to me that the paradise, see, one of the things is, the paradise to which Christ and the thief went upon death was not heaven. Okay, it seems to me that where he went upon death was not heaven, but it was a pleasant region, a region within Hades, within the realm of the dead. Now, I say that because Jesus apparently went to Hades upon his death and not to heaven. Okay, now why, why say that? There are a number of things that lead me to the conclusion that when Jesus died, he went to the realm of the dead instead of to heaven. Acts chapter 2 verse 31 says, David spoke prophetically of the resurrection of Christ, says he was not abandoned to Hades. He was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. And I understand that to mean that by the resurrection, Jesus was not allowed to remain in Hades, nor was his body left in the grave. He wasn't abandoned to Hades. You see, so it says, seems like, okay, where was he? He was in Hades, but he wasn't left there. That his body, his spirit was united with his resurrection body. Nor was his flesh allowed to see decay. Romans chapter 10, verse 6 and 7, it refers to Christ being in the abyss in death. Being in the abyss in death and in the Septuagint, you know, the Greek translation of the, of the Old Testament. In the Septuagint of Psalm chapter 71, verse 20, abyss refers to the depths of the earth as the abode of the dead, meaning Sheol. So we have that connection there where Christ in the abyss in death, and then we have this connection from the Septuagint of abyss referring to uh, the depths of the earth as the abode of the dead, meaning that, which would be Sheol. Okay, so you have that link there. And then thirdly, God's dwelling is in heaven, but in John chapter 20, verse 17, Jesus told Mary after being dead, not to touch him because he had not yet ascended to the Father. Well, he'd been dead and raised. What happened? Well, he had not yet ascended to the Father. So it looks to me and to many other people that what happens is that when Jesus died, he went to Hades. He went to the realm of the dead. He went to the abode of the dead. But, of course, he went to a very pleasant, uh, that realm of the dead. Okay, so... If the paradise to which Jesus and the thief went, if that's correct, if it was that region of Hades, paradise, the realm of the dead, then that's how we understand uh, the rich man and Lazarus. What is being portrayed there is what? We have the two uh, wings of the Hotel Hades. We have the punitive wing, and we have the blessed wing, paradise, all good, wonderful. And it looks like Jesus and the rich man went to that, that wing when Jesus died. Okay, so now, but I, having said that, now that's when Christ died. Now this is where some people, uh, you know, I guess more of the debate happens. It appears, at least to me and to many other people, that since Jesus' resurrection and ascension, Christians go to heaven when they die. That seems to me to be right. Okay, is that they go to heaven when they die, meaning they go to the place... The realm, the dimension, the sphere, whatever word you like, of God's unique dwelling or unique presence. They go to heaven in that sense. Okay, why think that? Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 to 23. Paul says that to die is gain, 
And that he longs to depart and be with Christ. Because that condition is far better than remaining in the body. Now, some people say, yeah, okay, Paul's talking about, I, I want to depart and be with Christ. Some people say, look, well, Paul doesn't mean that he'd be with Christ soon after his death, only that he would be with Christ eventually after staying in paradise for some time uh, after his death until Christ returns. But it doesn't seem to me that that's what Paul is saying. He clearly connects his departing to being with Christ, and he refers to the departure and his being with Christ. He refers to those things as a single event. And so this convinces many people, I have a quote here I'm not going to bore you with, but it convinces many people that, no, he's talking about a single event. These things are, are intimately connected so that his passing is to go into the presence of Christ. And so you have, you have that. Now, Paul says essentially the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, which I won't quote for you. In Acts chapter 7, verses 56 to 59, Stephen saw heaven being opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then while being stoned to death, he prays for the Lord Jesus to what? Receive my spirit. You see, receive my spirit. Now people say, well, you know, Stephen didn't think he'd be with Jesus soon after death, but that if he would be with him eventually in the resurrection. But he doesn't say, receive my resurrection body. He says, receive my spirit. See, receive my spirit. Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, the souls of the Christian martyrs. They're pictured as being under the heavenly altar. Okay, these are people who've died for their faith. Now, they're pictured as being under the heavenly altar. And I understand that Revelation is loaded with symbolism, apocalyptic literature. I know that. But there's something being said here about, you know, some message here. And I think the point is that though they've yielded their lives for their faith, they're in a blessed state uh, while they await the outworking of God's plan, they are in a blessed state, and it certainly seems that that blessed state includes the presence of God. Okay, so I look at this and I say, right, it looks to me when Christ died, he and the thief went to this realm of Hades, not to heaven. But it looks like Christians, when they die, that they wind up, they go to heaven. Now, that then suggests, if that's right, you say, well, how does that make any sense? That suggests that Christ's resurrection and his ascension removed whatever barrier there was between heaven and paradise. Okay, if you picture the realm of the dead, Hades, with the blessed wing, paradise, and there is some separation because when Christ goes to uh, paradise in this wing of Hades, he did not go to heaven. But now I'm saying, well, Christians, they are going to heaven. What's going on? Well, if Christ's resurrection and ascension, if it removed whatever barrier there was between the paradise wing of Hades and heaven, in other words, it's as though heaven annexed paradise. Does that make sense? You know, we're annexed, you see, like when a city annexes something. Now, I know that didn't happen. I'm just saying, so to speak, conceptually. I've used the way the idea that, that paradise is then opened up so that there is now one fellowship, see? So if Christ's resurrection and ascension had that effect, well, then it would make sense that, okay, yes, I do speak of Christians going to heaven, meaning the immediate presence of God when they die, while they await the resurrection, thinking that Christ went to Hades. And this fits nicely, by the way, with, with the fact that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Verses 2 through 4, Paul refers to heaven. In fact, the third heaven. The abode or, or dwelling place of God, he refers to it as paradise. Which is the very same word used in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And it's used only one other time in the New Testament in Revelation. So we have 2 Corinthians 12. Paul refers to it as paradise. So that fits, in my mind, with this idea of Christ had an effect. And you say, well, does it really matter? No, I started out saying the important thing is, is that when you die, Christians die, they enter into a blessed state of existence. Whether it's fitting or proper to call that heaven, that's what I'm talking about now. I think it is. Others would disagree. There's an objection, some, not an objection, but sometimes people wonder. They say, listen, in, in this talk about you know, being here and re being resurrected, if people have already, if they're already separated and in heaven, then why raise them up and judge them on the last day? I had somebody say that to me once. 
And I think it's important to understand, see, the spirits of deceased saints are in heaven. But where are their natural bodies? Their natural bodies are in the grave. You see, that's where their natural bodies are. In separation of body and spirit, that's the definition of death. And on the last day, the whole person will be raised from the dead, meaning his or her spirit, soul, reunited with a body that had been supernaturalized. Reunited with a body that has been made immortal, glorious, and all those things. The heaven that deceased saints now experience as disembodied spirits on the last day will be experienced by them as resurrected beings in a new creation. They will experience God's presence in wholeness of being. You say, well, why raise them up? That they may live again as whole persons rather than as disembodied spirits. That they may live as whole persons and may enjoy forever the presence of God in that state of full personhood. They will enjoy God's presence there. The final judgment relates to the eternal destiny of resurrected persons. Now, raising them up, it also this glorifies God in a distinctive way. You see, this is an important thing. It glorifies God. Death, which is the separation of body and spirit, it entered creation on the heels of sin. See, this state comes in and it is disruptive. It enters into creation on the heels of sin, and it's an enemy to be vanquished. You see, and the resurrection is the conquest of that enemy. Resurrection is the undoing of death. The resurrection is the swallowing of death in victory. Whose victory? God's victory. You see, so resurrection, that is a tribute. We are monuments to God's victory over death forever. That here death, this intruder comes in and God vanquishes it and we are the monuments that eternally glorify God in his victory over death. So that's another aspect. I had other stuff to say. But Sunday, next Sunday, Lord willing, we begin the book of Lamentations. Thank you.